It's December 20th, 1946, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So you've all heard of stories that are written on the back of a fag packet, but It's a Wonderful Life might be the first story written on a Christmas card. And it was on this day in 1946 that the film premiered in New York, three years after it first appeared on the back of an author's Christmas card. Yeah, Philip Van Dorenstern was looking around for a publisher of his short story, which was called The Greatest Gift. And in the absence of finding one, his idea was, well, I'll send it out as a lovely gift to my friends that is like 20 pages long. He's like, I'll give them the gift of words. <laughs> and so one of the gifts happened to end up in the hands of a movie producer who was like, yeah, I'll give you 10,000 bucks for that. That's so intimidating, though, isn't it? Like, I'm one of those people who will, by default, just write, love Ollie. <laughs> yeah. Merry Christmas, love Ollie. I know. I, like, I try hard to think, okay, what's a sentence that I can say that somehow conveys some personality or something about this person? <laughs> you know, great to see you last week, love Ollie, but it's really hard. And so after this card ended up in front of this producer, his name was David Hempstead, he actually had the idea that he wanted Cary Grant to star in a movie version. Isn't it funny that, like, every casting decision from 1946 would be Cary Grant or James Stewart? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just ended up with James Stewart, but I mean, it's not a surprise to hear it could have been Cary Grant. Yeah, and so when the movie ended up in the lap of Frank Capra, he obviously had the perfect person to lead the film, which was Jimmy Stewart. The other one. Yeah, the mm-hmm. other one. Get the other guy. But they had already worked together twice. They worked together on You Can't Take It With You and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which is widely regarded as the film that Jimmy Stewart should have won the Oscar for, but didn't. And Jimmy Stewart had then been away in the war. He actually signed on to do the film, I think about a week after he came back to the US. I mean, I'm sorry to harp on about this every time we watch a classic film, but he does not pass for 27. How old was he when he made this? Well, 52? Okay. No, okay. <laughs> he was born in 1908, which makes him 38. Right. But he is playing the character of George Bailey for a long over, time. Over a series of decades yeah. in the story. Yeah, I mean, towards yeah. the end of the story, he's certainly it's getting plausible. close to 38. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that first appearance where he shows up and he's meant to be just out of his teens, you're like, nope. Oh, yeah, when he's going to the school dance and yeah. you're like, mm, really? get him out of there. <laughs> Can we just talk about the school dance scene? So if you haven't seen the film before, it's a sequence of events from this young man's life that then leads to a Christmas Carol-style climax. And in one of these sequences, he's at high school dance, and as a prank, one of his love rivals for his sweetheart decides to roll back the dance floor to reveal the swimming pool beneath. And... In the film, this is portrayed as like a nostalgic memory that's great because everyone carried on dancing even when they fell in the pool. Weren't you watching it thinking, oh my God, this could just end so horribly? No, Ollie, this is so typical. I knew you would think something like that. What about the health and safety? What about the poor boy that couldn't <laughs> swim? I mean, yeah, exactly. But just If you're dancing and you're wearing black tie and you've had a few cocktails and you fall... <laughs> unexpectedly into the middle of a swimming pool with a dance floor roof over your head. Yeah. It's absolutely horrifying. I was even worried for some of the actors who were evidently instructed to, and then you dive in and then you dive yeah, in. Yeah, and yeah. It does have this sort right. of, you're going over the top, boys, kind of a thing. And it's not a set. That's no. a real, I looked into it, it's a, a real high school. It still has what they call the swim gym, the gym above a pool. It's at Beverly Hills High School. There is five foot head clearance, apparently. I'm sorry, I know this isn't the main issue with It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> but it is the thing that me. That's what people tuned in for. They were like, I wonder if they'll finally answer the question of what the head clearance was in that swim gym. It has been restored because it's difficult, obviously, with the humidity of a swimming pool in California to keep a, a wooden dance floor above it. Uh, and in 2016, it was shortlisted for the Sports Surface of the Year contest. Finally. Um, <laughs> I couldn't find any information as to who won or who else was in the shortlist, but it was nominated. <laughs> Still threatening the lives of high schoolers to this day. They probably guard the button a bit more closely now, though. Anyway, this is a Christmas film. I mean, that's why we're talking about it on the 20th of December, on this week of Christmas specials. It's seen as a Christmas film. But actually, it's full of sequences like that, which has got absolutely nothing to do with Christmas. I was watching thinking, why is this a Christmas film? Because I, I kept a note... The word Christmas only appears an hour and a quarter into the running time. And all of the sort of supernatural stuff, and there's this weird sequence at the beginning, which, I mean, it's astonishing to think this is in the era of Walt Disney because the animation standards are poor, but there's a sequence at the beginning with the angels sort of doing a radio drama over a picture of a sky. 
But otherwise, there's nothing supernatural no. and nothing Christmassy for the majority of this movie. Yeah, and Stern himself, the writer, says, I didn't think of it as a Christmas piece of work. And, you know, aside from the fact that he then sent it out as Christmas cards, I guess that made it Christmassy. But Capra also says, I didn't think of it as a Christmas thing either. So there's this sort of, you, you take it as a Christmas film because it's shown at Christmas. And I suppose it's bathed in nostalgia and sentiment and that's what makes it good Christmas viewing. But it's not everyone around a Christmas tree. It it is set in winter, even though it was actually filmed in summer, which has Jimmy Stewart sweating in a whole lot of scenes (laughs) that he shouldn't be sweating. And it was probably quite a relief to jump into the pool after all that. (laughs) But it really isn't Christmassy in so far as it's decked in tinsel and all of that. Well, I mean, when you boil it down, the most conspicuous way that it's Christmassy is that a lot of people contemplate suicide at Christmas. (laughs) Like That's really the part that Christmas plays in the film. It's just the fact that that happens to be the time of year where he's contemplating jumping off a bridge. Yeah, and in that way, it's a slightly inverse Christmas carol, isn't it? I mean, I've made the comparison already. People make the comparison because it is kind of like, look at what your life could be. But it's easier to swallow in a sense, isn't it? Because unlike Scrooge, who has to change his behaviour and stop being a jerk to enjoy the benefits of Christmas, Jimmy Stewart just has to recognise that he's already a good guy and stop complaining about the limitations of his life. Yeah, that is kind of the message. But I think the other thing that made this so quintessentially Christmassy was the fact that, well, A, it completely bombed at the box office, which is a sort of peculiar aspect of one of the films that's now regarded by many critics and lots of audiences as well as this sort of stone-cold cast iron classic. Yeah, it took $3.3 million in its original theatrical run. Right. And that's not a lot of money in 1946 money. Like sometimes we're like, oh yeah, but in 1946 that would be enough to fund this. No, $3.3 million was a flop for them. Yes, it meant that it lost about half a million because they constructed this really, really elaborate set. It occupied four acres of territory. It had 75 stores and buildings and 20 fully grown oak trees that were brought in, which now that I'm saying it doesn't seem like an awful lot of (laughs) (laughs) trees to have on a set. But apparently they even released (laughs) pigeons and cats and dogs onto the set to kind of give it this sense of lived-in reality. And it does actually look like a functioning town. Again, I don't know why you couldn't just have chosen a town and (laughs) blocked streets off. But anyway, had a huge budget, lost 500000 which meant that Capra was actually struggling to fund his next film. And B, because it had a surprising renaissance later on in its life when it fell out of copyright. Yeah, so at this time, and I don't think this is the case anymore, but the default copyright term was 28 years. And at the end of that, you had to renew it. And if you didn't, it fell into the public domain. And so... This is what happened with It's a Wonderful Life. So in the mid-70s then, it came into public domain, which meant that any TV station that had a gap in its schedule could just shove that in there and not worry about having to pay any money to the rights holder. Which means, let's be clear, I mean, again, you can contextualise this a bit. Like, this wasn't an iconic Christmas film, so maybe it would fall off someone's desk pile. But still, Paramount forgot to renew an Oscar-nominated film. (laughs) That's what happened in 1974. They forgot to say, oh, we own this. And the same thing happened with another film that we consider a a really huge classic now, which was slightly more successful at the time, which was His Girl Friday. I think the owners of It's Wonderful Life did eventually get the copyright back. but NBC got it in 1993. Yeah, it took a long time. 20 years. I think it's quite difficult. So in that 20 years, it became a staple of of the American Christmas TV schedules, right? It's still not... I mean, I, I feel like... Like a lot of things, when you hear that they're a trend in America, particularly because of the internet, you know, people tweeting and instering about this thing, um, it then feels like something we should do. We should watch It's a Wonderful Life. But actually, there isn't a tradition in Britain, is there, to particularly to watch It's a Wonderful Life. But Americans, particularly baby boomers, it seems to me, because it was their childhood, wasn't it, when this film came out? They really got into in this period where the film was out of copyright and on telly all the time on every network, watching it every Christmas. And that's how it became a Christmas tradition. Well, it is actually shown every year on Channel 4 in the UK as well. And I wonder whether that is a sort of peculiar type of cultural imperialism that uh, the US practices over us all, that not only do we take their films, but we also take the films that come to represent Christmas for them Mm are imported as kind of Christmas viewing for us as well. And they're paying for it, you know. It's not it's not in the public domain anymore, so they are actually paying for the right to do it now. Did you know that there's a sequel film called Clarence? It's uh, a crap life. Which is, <laughs> <laughs> um, It was a made-for-TV movie uh, no. that was set in December 1989. Is this going to be like the remake of The Big Sleep that Michael Winner did? <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> Apparently the only thing that is in this sequel that comes from the original is Clarence, the angel who 
has come down and earned his wings through doing he's this. He's a good character. Like nowadays, there would be a Netflix 10-part series would about be, him, yeah, wouldn't yeah. there? Yeah. Anyway, he's played by Robert Carradine, best known for Revenge of the Nerds. And it has absolutely no official reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, <laughs> but one audience reviewer wrote, every time this movie is seen, a demon gets his wings, which I thought was quite <laughs> nice. Tomorrow. My first reaction was, that sounds like someone doing vocal scales. Are you sure that's what you want? Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.